and call the um, meeting of the Nantucket Historical Commission to order. I see that we do have a quorum um, and I have our script that I'm gonna go ahead and read. Um, let's find this. Um, so as a preliminary matter, this is um, Hillary Rayport, um, chair of the Nantucket Historical Commission. Um, I'd like to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and um, can hear me. Uh, we do um, have a guest uh, today, Matthew Bronski. Matthew, can you hear me? Just give me a thumbs up. Great. And um, we also are expecting at some point Chris Skelly to be joining us from the Massachusetts Historical Commission, but I'm not sure at what point he'll join. Um, and so if anybody has a problem hearing me, if you could just um, let me know or message Holly, make sure to address that. Um, so members, when I call your name, uh, please respond in the affirmative. I, I'm just going to go across. David Silver. Present. Mickey Rowland. Present. Tom Montgomery. Present. Angus McLeod. Present. Uh, Clement Dirks. Present. Um, and I see we have Chris Skelly here. Um, and I see some other expected people are joining. Um, Don Hill Holgate is joining. Um, our alternate member, Don. And Michelle um, appears to be joining. And yeah, I'm here. Me, uh... Okay, great. Um, so uh, we also have Holly Bacchus here, who I know can hear me because she gave me a thumbs up. Um, good morning. Uh, the open meeting of the Nantucket Historical Commission is being conducted remotely, consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID 19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the virus, we've been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings, and as such, the governor's order dispense the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order, which you can find posted with agenda materials for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with deliberation of the meetings. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless participation is required by law, the meeting will feature public comment. For this meeting, um, the Historical Commission is convening by video conference. It's posted on the town website. I don't find how the public may join. Um, the meeting is being recorded. All attendees are participating by video conference. Uh, be aware other folks may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. Um, all supporting materials that have been provided, members of this body are available on the town's website. Uh, the public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda, unless I note otherwise. Um, we are now turning to the first item on the agenda, but before we do, let me cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. I will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, the chair will go down the line of members, inviting each by name to provide any comment. Um, Sorry, I've lost my script here. Uh, please hold until your name is called. Um, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you're not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. If members wish to engage in a conversation with other members, please do so through the chair to care to identify yourself. Um, for items with public comment, after members have spoken, the chair will afford public comments to those members of the public that have joined the meeting by Zoom members of the public who wish to speak must state their names and be acknowledged to speak through the chair and public comment is for items that are not otherwise on our agenda. Um, each vote taken during this meeting will be conducted by roll call. Um, Okay, so now we are going to turn to the first item on our agenda. Um, I'd like to establish that we do have a quorum and I'd like to call for any public comment. Is there any public comment? I'm hearing none. Um, I'd like to ask for a motion to approve the minutes for um, July uh, 10th, 
we do not have minutes for August 7th, so we're going to hold that until the next meeting. May I have a motion to approve the minutes from July 10th? Second. Okay, so that was moved by Tom, seconded by Angus. Um, Mickey? Mickey, can I have an aye? Aye. Um, Clement? Aye. Don? Aye. David? Aye. Um, Tom? Okay. Um, thank you very much. I have one announcement uh, before we proceed with the agenda, which is um, regarding our agenda. So there's a, an item on our agenda, which is the preventative maintenance bylaw citizen concern. Um, there's been a complaint about um, this item, and I would like to request that we continue this item for another meeting. I'd like to get feedback about the complaint before we discuss this item. So um, we, unless there's any need to discuss this, we will, sorry, if, unless there's any objection to my um, change, making this uh, change to the agenda, I'd like to move that we not be discussing preventative maintenance bylaw in this meeting or any structures associated with that. Second. Okay. Um, yes. Hillary, I have trouble starting my video, but I'm here. Georgia. Oh, Georgia. Welcome, Georgia. Okay. Can um, the minutes show? Oh, there the it is. It went on. Okay. Join the meeting. Ah, okay. Great. All right. So now we've just taken a vote to make a change to our agenda and not discuss um, the last item, which was preventative maintenance. Um, so I'll take a roll call vote. Tom. Um, Angus. Aye. Don. Aye. Georgia. Aye. David. Aye. Uh, Clement. Aye. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so, Madam Chair, I would, for just a point of clarification, um, what agenda would that be posted on in the future for people that are in the public that are, are here for that? You mean if we do continue it to another meeting? Yes, ma'am. Yes. So, um, we'll confirm if it will come back as an agenda. I'm waiting for town council's advice about that. Um, but I, so I can't really answer that question, but it would be properly noticed. And of course, any member of the public is free to contact you, Holly, if they have a special interest and would like to be especially notified. Does that sound reasonable? Thank you. Okay, sure. Um, all right, so moving on, just a couple administrative announcements before we get to um, Matthew's presentation. Um, so I gave a report to the select board on August 12th. Um, one of the wonderful outcomes of that presentation was that um, Dawn Hill Holgate volunteered to be our liaison to our commission. Um, Dawn, I'm looking for Dawn, I think she's here. Oh, here she is, hi, thank you. It helps to have the wave, great. So, you know, um, there's a lot of concern and interest in productive conversation, productive communication between our relatively new commission and the town. And um, I think that'll, that's in everyone's interest. And I'm certainly very grateful that Dawn, given everything she has to do, is interested um, to be a part of our commission. I also want to mention that Dawn um, is especially well suited to being part of our commission because her first job working in the town was working in the office of the HDC and she al also has served as a commissioner on the HDC. So I think she's going to be a really helpful uh, point of contact and liaison on our commission. Um, some of the other outcomes, uh, we did present our um, proposed mission statement. Um, we did talk about our big goals, which is to update our surveys and to become a certified local government for a number of reasons, including um, access to grants to help us uh, with funding to update the surveys. We talked about the fact that this requires a memorandum of understanding that just makes it clear what we do and what the Historic District Commission does and how the two commissions work together and um, that we met jointly with HDC on June 30th and we're waiting for some progress um, on that topic. Um, the select board was supportive um, of this initiative 
it was really nice to hear so many supportive comments from the select board about our existence and about our work. Um, so I appreciated that the meeting was recorded. It's not our public record. Um, and we did agree that as the next step, we would um, reconvene with the select board in about a month at their um, discretion to talk about the MOU and our initiatives. Dawn, did you want to make any comment about the meeting with the select board? Um, I, I thought it was generally a good meeting to get a feel for what you all are working on and, um, and to talk about sort of future direction. Um, I do feel very strongly that the HDC has to be very supportive of these initiatives in terms of updating surveys and, um, and the way that the HDC and the Historical Commission can support each other. Um, so I'm looking for some more feedback from them on that. I know it's very hard to get there with their workload. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, th I think that, um, that it, was, it was a good initial discussion about the mo moving forward with the Historical Commission. Yeah, great. And I absolutely agree with those comments. Um, so we also have an item of annual report. Uh, we do have to make an annual report to the town. Um, our goal is to get that to the town in October. Georgia has submitted a preliminary draft to me. I'm working on it and we'll present it in our September meeting. Uh, for consideration by the commission. Um, moving on, one point of feedback from the select board. Um, the select board very was very happy to have our um, recognition to have to hear that the commission had recognized a group of expert advisors. Um, this would be our what we had been calling a resource and advisory board. They did comment that the use of the term board is confusing because of course a board, using the term board implies some sort of responsibility. Um, so I'm going to suggest that we change the name of um, that group to the, um, historic, the NHC resource advisors, the NHC resource advisors. Um, and I'd like a motion to hear if anybody agrees with that. And so moved. Tom. Second. From Georgia. Okay. Um, all in favor, uh, David? Aye. Mickey? Aye. Um, Clement? Aye. Don? Aye. Georgia? Aye. And I also am in favor. Um, the Madam last Chair, if I just, sorry, I'd like to just um, request that the advisory group. Um, their mission, what have you, what exactly is their role so that there's no confusion from the public's perspective as well as for, you know, um, transparency with government. Yeah. So um, what exactly are you requesting, Holly? Do you want a statement? I, I think that, um, you know, if we're gonna have a, a list of people, which these people are, are fantastic, they have a lot of um, preservation and Nantucket experience, I think it's just for clarity's sake, understanding what their ed, their resource would be, our advisory, um, so it's clear what yeah. exactly would they be providing, that they're that, that that's clear that they're not a, a board within a board, they're not meeting, they don't they don't do those kind of things, but they provide information. I just think their role in the overall commission needs to be clarified because I don't think there's any other historical commissions out there that um, have this type of uh, resource. Okay, um, so we had a couple meetings where we talked about the board and what they would do and we voted to create, sorry, the group and we voted to create this group, um, but it sounds like it's still not totally clear to even our staff liaison and the public. So for our next meeting, I'll um, write up a summary and we can accept it again with the proper name and if there are any concerns, everyone will be able to to raise that. Does that sound okay, Holly? Okay, thanks for that advice. Um, I also have an announcement, um, which is that um, the Community Foundation of Nantucket has established a fund for preservation. Um, it's called the Keep Nantucket Real Fund, and that is the fund that is paying for the historic, um, the, uh, the preservation engineering study um, for the streets, which was presented to us and presented to the town. Um, 
and we are moving on to the staff liaison report. Um, Holly, what would you like to tell us? Um, well, I, I wanted to give some, um, some criticism or positive, you know, um, response to the discussion of the um, mission statement, because I think that was something that obviously everybody's aware that was not um, approved. Um, so I do have some uh, ideas that I'd like to float to the commission, if you're um, okay with that. So Holly, I absolutely am okay with that. And I think Chris uh, can also comment helpfully. I'm a little concerned that I don't specifically have mission statement on the agenda for this yep. meeting. Yep. So, you know, there's been a lot of sensitivity about our agenda for this meeting and yep. I didn't expect to be talking about the mission statement. So um, I think what we can do, if you wouldn't mind if we moved on to hear from Matthew, since he's our special guest, and then perhaps we can revisit this topic of just not making any decisions about the mission statement, but how to discuss and come to some preparation for a follow up about the mission statement. Is that okay? Sounds great. Okay, thank you. Is there any other, um, anything else you wanted to tell us, Holly, as part of your staff liaison report? Um, I know you have on here the certified local government um, application. I can say that um, I think as everybody's aware that there was enthusiasm from the select board on that. The biggest thing is, you know, as we're all aware that the uh, certified local government application requires an MOU between both commissions. Um, it's not something that's um, unique in Nantucket's perspective because there are other, um, not many, but there are other um, towns within the Commonwealth that have that. Um, so, um, they, as you all are aware, the HDC has had this on their agenda. We've been um, extremely busy. The HDC is back to pre-pandemic time as far as applications go. We had a five-hour HDC meeting this week. So, um, at, you know, this is on their agenda, um, but, um, you know, I, I just ask for, for patience um, for that discussion and, and hopefully, um, you know, there can be an, an agreement and moving forward and, and being able to get the uh, formal support from the select board. So, thank you. Thank you, Holly. I certainly hope so too. Yeah, I mean, it has been seven weeks since we asked and you know presented the MOU, but um, we also are very aware of how busy the HTC is. Okay, so now I would like to um, take a minute to introduce uh, Matthew, Bronski, um, who is with us as our special guest. Um, Matthew B. Bronski is a preservation engineer. He's a principal with Simpson, Gumperts, and Hager, um, where he leads um, their envelope investigation and rehabilitation restoration design efforts. Um, Matthew's resume has, we've shared it with this commission, but it's an extremely long and distinguished um, resume. He's worked on numerous highly significant buildings, including buildings designed by P.W. and Stearns, H.H. Richardson, Frank Lloyd Wright, Aero Saarinen, Philip Johnson, Paul Rudolph, I am Pei, and the list goes on and on. Um, he oversees analysis of testing building materials, including um, masonry, stone, concrete. Um, he's lectured and been published on topics ranging from public uh, preservation philosophy and standards to the durability of traditional masonry construction. Um, and I'll share that I met Matthew at the Preservation Massachusetts Inc. conference um, where he was talking about restoration of historic uh, masonry. And I approached him after the meeting and I said, you know, on Nantucket, we are concerned about the streetscape and we're really looking for somebody who is an expert on paving. Um, do you know anybody like that? And he looked at me and he said, well, um, the really interesting thing about um, Nantucket is that you have authentic beach cobbles. And I thought, you know, how many people will know that we have authentic beach cobbles in our cobblestone road here? Um, and Matthew then shared that he had actually received the uh, prestigious Rome Prize to study at the American Institute in Rome, where one of his topic of studies was Roman paving, historic Roman paving. So. Um, through the generosity of individuals contributing to the Community Foundation of Nantucket, the Community Foundation has um, hired Matthew, who um, has been studying um, 
historic pavement in colonial New England and historic cobblestone and Belgian block paving and flagstone paving around the world. Um, he will make a final re written report in September, but he is here um, to join us to give us a brief update about that report. And I will turn the floor over to Matt. Okay, thank you so much, Hillary. Can everyone hear me well, if you could just give a thumbs up? Great, and I'd also like to share my screen if that's okay. Okay. Yes, you can do that. Okay, thanks. Now, let me get something of interest up there for you to see. Here we go. Can people see that well? Um, yep. Yeah. Okay, so thanks so much for having me. And as Hillary mentioned, it is, you know, it's a pleasure to be here and it's really a thrill to be working on this because I, you know, hadn't been there in a while, but I do remember the cobblestone streets of Nantucket really well. And uh, I think stone street paving is pretty unusual within Massachusetts. I, I lived in downtown Lowell for some years and we had some granite set streets there. And if, if you don't know the terminology well, the, the sets are essentially kind of, you know, shaped like bricks, rectangles of stone. They've been, they've been cut, they've been dressed. Um, in several cities, Lawrence and others have those, but, but cobbles are really pretty unusual. And I did see quite a lot of them in Italy um, the year I was living there and studying there. So it's, it's great to work on them. And um, most of my practice is preservation. And, and I've done a fair number of stone paving projects over the years with granite, with marble, uh, with bluestone. Um, and also with brick, but, but it's kind of a topic near and dear to my heart. And this is just such an incredible historic resource that, that it's really thrilling to be helping you out with this. And, and I hope I can do that. So just to kind of give you a, a brief update on where I am and, and starting with just the, the focus of the study. So I think primarily the focus here is, is an engineer is to bring an engineering assessment, albeit a preservation sensitive one, to some of the technical issues that have really arisen over the years concerning the installation, rehabilitation, and maintenance of your cobblestone streets. Um, and I know that's been an up and down history over the years, and there have been periods where they're really well maintained and been touted for their durability and, you know, minimal maintenance that's needed, and other times where they've been viewed as kind of a, a headache or a thorn in the side of uh, people that need to maintain them. But, but hopefully really the goal here is getting back to that place where they're really a pride and joy and well-maintained and um, you know, take, it takes very little effort and, and money to keep them up compared to some of your more contemporary streets. So some of the issues that I was really honed in on and that I heard concerns about are um, you know, issues with the maintenance, um, reducing the maintenance of these, improving the durability, and especially the tendency of the stones to come loose. Um, the ability of the streets to take contemporary vehicular loads, including truck loads. Um, what are really the best practices, including materials and methods for installing, rehabilitating, and maintaining these? And the actual procedures for setting uh, cobblestones and curbstones. What are the maintenance issues, the abilities to, ability to resist loads um, versus other considerations? I'm sorry, this is a little jumpy, jumping ahead. Um, and secondarily, I think that's really the primary focus because that's where it, really where most of the engineering is. Secondarily, how do you balance the multiplicity of issues you have with historic sidewalks? A lot of competing concerns there. So let's start with the cobblestone streets, which again are really the, the primary focus. And um, years, uh, so for the past 25 years, I've, I've worked at SGH and focused on preservation and I lead their preservation practice today. But for a couple of years prior to that, when I first came out of school and a couple summers as well, I actually worked as a highway engineer. So I did a lot of work on the mass turnpike, assessing pavement, designing pavement, rehabilitation and replacement. Um, for you know the mass turnpike, which is kind of as big and as heavy as it gets in terms of truck loads, highway loads. Um, so typically, the way we, the way you know Mass DOT, the way the Federal Highway Transportation Administration classify pavements are in terms of these two broad categories: rigid, which is like reinforced concrete, which you don't see much around here, but you see quite a bit in New York, um, or flexible, which is bituminous concrete, which most people would call asphalt. But asphalt is really just the binder that holds together sand and coarse aggregate. 
Um, and, and these are really a hybrid. They're neither truly rigid nor truly flexible, and they have characteristics of each. So as, whereas concrete and bituminous, you're kind of two more common contemporary materials form kind of a monolithic surface, um, the stone or cobblestone paving does not. So you have the rigid elements, which are the stones themselves, and then you have a flexible component, which is the, the joint or the binding material between them. And um, there are some real benefits to that, uh, especially today. So in an era where we're increasingly concerned, and rightly so, with environmental issues, sustainability, groundwater runoff, recharging aquifers, things like that, having a pervious pavement is really an asset. And uh, one thing I did note on my site visit, it's also particularly a plus for you because you have very, very few catch basins compared to most contemporary roads. So if you look at the number of places that water can actually run in and get off the street on an Nantucket road compared to almost any town, city around Massachusetts, you will find you have far fewer. That really struck me. And I mentioned that to Rob McNeil, who was, who was great, was super helpful. And you know, he mentioned that that struck him too when he first came there, how few catch basins there are. So not having those, the water needs some other way to get off the street and not form huge puddles, which is you know, not only a nuisance, but it can be a safety issue too for things like hydroplaning. So having a pervious pavement, I think is, is really a good thing for anyone, but it's particularly good for Nantucket. Um, so part of what I've been doing too is a, is a good technical literature search and a lot of the, the good literature is actually uh, out in Europe. So can these withstand contemporary vehicular loads? They really can and the research is saying that and it's really all about the sub-base design and compaction. So if you think of it, um, concrete is usually around 4,000, 5,000 PSI compressive strength. Um, stone and you mostly have granite in your mix of uh, cobbles, beach cobbles, um, might be on the order of 15, even 20,000 PSI. So granite is actually much stronger than concrete and that surprises a lot of people. Um, and and uh, concrete is stronger than bituminous. So, so the inherent strength of the paving material of the granite is far greater than what you would get um, with a contemporary material like bituminous or even with reinforced concrete. Um, but it's really all about that sub base. It's about that, you know, the underlying layer that you don't see beneath the roadway uh, where they excavate out kind of the topsoils, the native soils, they put down gravel, crushed stone, how deep that is, how well compacted it is, how well it drains water. Um, those are all really critical to the ability to resist um, heavy vehicular loads, like a big truck making a delivery. And uh, in terms of kind of cobbles coming loose, like you see in the photo at the right, which seems to be one of the real primary headaches that, that people are most concerned about, um, one of the most significant loads on those is actually not the truck going straight down the street, it's a vehicle parallel parking. Uh, because as, a, as the truck is moving straight ahead, if you have a good sub base, um, you know, it should, it should be fine with that. If the sub base is weak or is not well compacted, you'll get rutting, which is kind of a, a shallow little swale or trough along um, the lines that the, the wheels typically run in. And that's a really common phenomena, even in the best highways. And that was kind of the thing that we would typically see on the Mass Pike when uh, the roads really needed to be repaved was there was a lot of rutting and the water can sit in those and cars can hydroplane and it becomes time to repave. So no roadway is immune to that, but a good sub base will really do well to uh, prevent that. And actually with the granite being a lot stronger than bituminous, with the same sub base, the cobble should be more resistant to rutting than a bituminous road. Uh, but kind of getting back to this, this torque or this twisting force that will tend to kind of spin uh, the stones loose. The worst case for that is actually when cars parallel park and they're not moving, but they crank the wheel. So you have kind of the full weight of the vehicle and in particular, the wheels under the engine, which typically the front, you have all that weight right there. And then that's just kind of turned into a twisting force on the stone. So um, it's not coincidental that you see the curb in this photo because often that force of someone really cranking the wheel to get out of a parallel space is when they're parked right alongside the curb. 
So that's, that's kind of the torture test on, on any sort of paving, but especially cobbles. And it's, it's interesting doing the, the research on this, you know, I had seen uh, that photo on the right I actually took in Italy. I, I watched a lot of um, Pietrini, which is what they call these. Uh, they're really neither sets nor cobbles, but they're kind of a, um, almost a, shaped like a wedge or like a molar of a tooth that's driven into the ground. Um, I watched a lot of those being set and they're driven in vertically and very close together. So you can see those being installed on the right, but Irish literature, uh, English literature all agrees. And so essentially if you're using um, a cobble rather than a cut stone, you know, the literature all agrees that you really want something oblong. So it's kind of like that lower middle diagram there. And this is a, uh, that's from an Italian paper in 1898. And there was really a lot of good research, engineering research on this between say like uh, the late 1800s and the first quarter of the 20th century. So say uh, 18, even, even mid 18, like 50s, you start to see some papers and then they really uh, accelerate say around the 1880s and 1890s through 1910. And then it starts to tail off as concrete and bituminous become um, more prevalent. But in the days when you had a lot of engineering programs and departments, and that was the common paving, people were really looking at this. So they were realizing that, you know, kind of uh, a sphere isn't ideal. It's, it's hard to make a good road out of uh, cantaloupe shaped uh, stones, but kind of something that's more shaped like a baked potato. And here they're giving some ideal ratios is really perfect. And the kind of pavement and the right that you see that's involved in, uh, that's become really the tradition in Rome, these Pietrini, um, you know, they're square or diamond shaped on the surface, but they're tapered. So they're driven into the ground like a wedge. So they're almost just like a slightly squared off version of that one you see on the right. And that really works well because they're deeper than they are wide. And when you impart that twisting force with cars banking a turn or parallel parking, um, they, they really can resist that and they start to distribute the load uh, to the stones around them. So they kind of share that road and don't bear it all on their own. And so that, uh, that right photo and that lower middle diagram are from uh, Italy and from Italian literature. The, the one on the left is actually from English literature. So that's actually Oxford in the top photo. Uh, and you can see the same thing where they're, they're setting those stones oblong. And this was an interesting paper because they completely redid all this paving, this is right around the Radcliffe camera. It's used in a lot of films and all now that it's redone as a, a period, period setting. Uh, and initially they just kind of laid them all flat and they kicked loose in a, in a short number uh, of years and, and it all had to be redone. And they realized that they had to drive these in vertically. So this paper was kind of all about that effort and how much better they're holding up now, now that they're, they're driven in that way. So, uh, all the techn technical literature here really aligned with what I had been seeing uh, out in the field and in, in Italy the year I was there. So that was, that was kind of interesting. And it also aligned with, you know, what I was hearing uh, from people like Penelope Austin and other people who had some insights. It was kind of, we were all converging that you've really got to drive these in vertically um, and you just can't lay them on the flat. The kind of Interesting tie was um, a lot of the literature that, that Hillary pulled together over the years as they were repaving and some of the, some of the art and, and uh, technology had gradually been lost as, as they repaved rows, they wondered why they had so many stones left over. So you can imagine if you took all those stones that are like this and weighed them like this, it won't take nearly as many to pave a surface because you're using the longer dimension so you would have stones left. So it also Kind of, uh, kind of implies that for some years when they were having maintenance problems, they weren't being set vertically, but rather they were being set on the flat. So the curbs, uh, the curbs in, in an engineering sense, they need to resist an overturning moment from the sidewalk. So you can imagine or think of these as almost like a little retaining wall. So imagine they're holding back the higher soil on the sidewalk and sometimes some other loads like uh, lateral loads from roots and things from trees trying to push them over. Um, and then they're acting like a wall and they have to resist that. So most often when these are, um, these are displaced, uh, you see them being displaced outward from the sidewalk toward the street. 
but I did actually see a few that were going the other way, that were going from the street um, into the sidewalk. So that would tend to occur when you have vehicles traversing uh, the curb, kind of going up and over. And I understand there's a phenomenon called Nantucket parking, which is pretty common, where people do that quite a bit. So they're parking two wheels on the street, they're going up and over the curb and back down, um, you know, multiple times a day or whenever they park. So that would that would explain the less common mode of them being pushed in toward the sidewalk. Um, the historic schist curb material, um, you know, schist can vary a lot in terms of the minerals that it contains and, the, and hence the durability can, can vary quite a bit too. Um, some of the schist in Pennsylvania is notoriously non-durable because it has a very non-durable mineral in it. But a lot of the schist around here in New England, and you see it in a lot of foundations in Cambridge and surrounds, uh, is actually pretty durable. Um, the track record of your schist having been out there, you know, 150 years in a, in a pretty severe environment, is it really looks like it's holding up well. Um, so you don't see just general degradation or, you know, softening or exfoliation like you do with less durable stones like brownstone. So it seems like it has a good track record of durability in and of itself. I know the, the concrete restraint has uh, become kind of a controversial issue. And uh, I'm still digging a little bit more into the technical properties of, of our New England schist. But based on that, it seems like it's, it's a very hard stone. It seems to have a lot of quartz content, which is a very hard mineral. Um, and so it, it doesn't seem like the concrete would really harm it unless you form a trough or a bathtub that's going to uh, trap water and kind of hold it in water. And a lot of the DPW details um, kind of create that. So they'll, they'll dump concrete in and then they'll build it up on both sides and it will form this concrete saddle around the curb. Um, I noticed the Nantucket DPW detail does not do that. It actually has gravel bottom and then it has a kind of a blob of concrete on each side. So that's much better. And I think the focus would really need to be making sure that you carry out that detail and execute it and have a well-drained surface. And another kind of potential, you know, tweak you could, you could think about is um, just having a sacrificial piece of paper between uh, like craft paper, brown paper, you know, the brown paper we would get in bags at the grocery store between the bottom of the shift curve and the concrete so that later on years down the line, kind of the principle of reversibility, the two can easily be separated and you won't have the bond. And you don't actually need the bond to resist the lateral load. You kind of need the mass of the concrete pushing against the curb, but it doesn't need to be adhered to it. So that, you know, that could be a win-win for, for that detail, I would hope. And then the sidewalks, you know, I think it was really fewer engineering issues here and more just how do you balance so many competing um, constraints and issues. And, um, you know, as we kind of looked at this collectively as a group and Holly was there and Hillary was there and, and Rob McNeil and others, you know, there are just these issues where, you know, them not being perfect and being a little bit rustic is in a way part of the charm, but it also makes them more difficult to traverse, not only for someone in a wheelchair, but someone who's a little older and maybe has some mobility issues or someone with a baby stroller and things like that. Um, roots kind of pushing up the paving, you know, whether it's brick or whether it's uh, stone flags in front of some of the, the older houses along Main Street. Um, the width of the sidewalk versus the width of the street. So that's one thing that, that has often migrated over time. And um, typically what we tend to see in a lot of um, historic cities and towns is uh, the streets kept getting wider and wider and wider over the past hundred or so years as, um, you know, is vehicles started going faster and trucks got bigger, fire trucks, dump trucks, snow plows. So there was concern with turning radii and cutting off corners. And um, so a lot of times what, what happened was the, the street got wider and the sidewalks got narrower. And actually DCR did a, did a pretty interesting project a, a few years ago where they saw that trend through all the historic photos along Memorial Drive along the Charles River Basin, you know, kind of near 
MIT and the universities and, um, and realize how much um, kind of public space had been lost to pedestrians, joggers, bike riders given over to traffic. So they actually narrowed those streets uh, and widened the sidewalks and in some cases got rid of parallel parking to do so. And uh, that was pretty successful and they did a, a similar project um, just a couple years ago um, at a, a more upstream area of the Charles. Um, so um, so that's, that's often been the general trend. And you also see that in terms of, um, in terms of traffic calming, you know, people wanting not only to make the roads work for snow plows and fire trucks and vehicles, but also wanting them to make, want, wanting to make them work for, uh, for pedestrians and cyclists and everyone else who might use it. Uh, but I also understand the kind of considerations about, you know, the scale of the sidewalk is, is, you know, in regards to the scale of the facades and all those issues. So I think on a lot of these, you know, there's, there's not a perfect solution. There's not one right or wrong. There are just multiple competing demands that you're trying to find the best fit, the best balance for in each particular case. And it might be different. It might be a different solution on one block than the others. And um, kind of the photo with the tree at the right, we, we stopped at one area just like that and talked about, you know, what could you really do here? And in some cases, you can raise the sidewalk and, um, you know, give those roots some room to breathe and level out the surface and, and it's a great solution. And in other areas, you can't do that because there's a door right there and you can't have the water draining from the sidewalk into someone's front door. And, you know, in some cases, you raise that sidewalk and all of a sudden the curb is so high that someone who's parallel parked can't open their door. Um, you know, so there are just a lot of kind of issues that need to be balanced almost on a case by case basis. And, and sometimes it might be different in front of one house versus the other. Um, so just those are some of the types of issues we got into discussing. And I think uh, accessibility is not just kind of the bumpiness or the, the vertical offsets, but it also gets to be the cross slope too. Um, one thing we did talk about is there are so many things to balance here. You know, really the best approach is to think through the sidewalks and the streets as a whole um, all at once because that will afford the most opportunity to, to balance those in, in the best possible way. Um, so, you know, if raising the sidewalk would work really well in a particular area, but then the curb becomes so high that it's hard for people to get over, or you can't open a door against it, um, then it could be that the, the level of the street or the crown of the street could be adjusted at the same time. And that might be an opportunity to, um, you know, to eliminate some, some potholes and do some regrading and, you know, pitch the street a little better toward the catch basins that you do have, et cetera. So I think, working streets and sidewalks in uh, conjunction is really the way to go. A um, couple of folks we met with from the Preservation Institute in Nantucket mentioned their LIDAR survey, and it sounds like that's really gonna be great information for doing that because they'll have elevational information of sidewalks, curbs, front steps, you know, those kind of critical hard points that often set uh, the constraints on what can be done or what can't be done to kind of work out the best solution from uh, from one door all the way across the sidewalk, down the curb, across the street, and back up the other side. Um, that'll be a great tool and a great starting point. So that's that's kind of the brief overview of um, progress to date, and I'd, I'd just love to take any questions you have. Thank you. I have a question, Hillary. Yes. Um, thank you, Matthew. And Tom, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Matthew. Tom Montgomery. Uh, I, I don't know how many uh, slides ago it was, but you were talking about uh, the heading was curbs and the Nantucket DPW uh, detail at the very bottom there uh, has gravel, a gravel bottom to drain. Um, Sorry, was, is that uh, the same thing as we uh, as we had at the at the head of Judith Chase Lane in Fear Street, where they had gravel at the bottom and put in hard pack and then put a little bit of cement uh, on either side of it and then installed the curbs? Yeah, I don't know exactly what was done there, but I did get a sheet of typical details from Rob McNeil. Um, 
which which did show gravel bottom, concrete on both sides, and then the curb mounted that's in far, between them. That that's good. I'm saying that that's good that, um, yeah, it does have the gravel bottom and that the water could drain out. It wouldn't be trapped against the bottom of the stone. Okay, thank you. This is Angus. Um, regarding that detail, and Matthew, thank you so much for all your wisdom and, and comments, and we look forward to your report. Um, my question is, in a case where you do set the curb into concrete, what you're recommending is that you do have a paper um, separation, so it's reversible? Yeah, so that would be essentially a sacrificial separation layer. So it could be the brown craft paper I mentioned. It could even be a red rosin paper, which is typically used under flooring. So the thought would be that this is something that would be you know, biodegradable, just a regular paper, it wouldn't be a membrane or anything. So it would, it would keep the concrete from bonding to the schist, which would make it more easily reusable 30 years from now when they, when they redid the sidewalk uh, again or something like that. Um, but it would, you know, it would, it would just degrade in, in the moisture and would just, um, just prevent the adhesive bond of the concrete to the stone. Matthew, this is Don. I have a question about root trimming. Can, are those trees too big to trim roots to lower the sidewalks instead of raise the sidewalks? So again, I think that's probably a, a case by case uh, basis. I know we, we did meet with the, the Shampoo uh, brothers, if I have the name correct, um, who seem to be, you know, kind of the tree experts, uh, street tree experts out on the island. And they were talking about some some technologies they thought would work really well when they when they redo a sidewalk. Um, so some air jetting uh, to to clean around the roots. And they were even talking about some new soils uh, that have been developed that are so-called structural soils. And and we talked about one of the common problems is you know for the if you were focused again this is about balancing the different considerations. If you were focused solely on the health of the tree and this were in your backyard you'd probably put a lot of very soft, you know, kind of mulch and compost and manure around it. Um, but that type of material is just so prone to settling that, you know, that pavement would be all over the place. And if it were just pavement, you would have just straight clean gravel or sand, mm -hmm. uh, which would be a nice firm sub base and would drain well and the pavement wouldn't go anywhere, but that's not good for the tree, right? So you're trying to figure out how to balance what's good for the tree with what's good for the sidewalk. And they said, uh, Michael Van Valkenburg, uh, landscape architects in Cambridge, have been doing some interesting work with a, um, a geotechnical firm that does some interesting soil development and kind of together they came up with some, some very interesting structural soils that, that strike that balance. So they've got some sort of mix of non-compactable material, something to provide some airspace because the roots do need air um, but they're firm and they don't, they don't settle or, or give as much. So they, they thought there was some promise there. Thank you. Um, I have a question, Matthew, on the topic of the sub-base and the permeability. Um, the, the specification the town is using currently calls for, for stone dust and um, we have quite a lot of cobblestone resetting happening this summer. Um, the, the street was just filled with some potholes and a lot of dangerous cobbles. So for public safety reasons, um, the DPW has started repairing those. They just thought they couldn't wait any longer. Um, but uh, now it's really, in my opinion, and this is my opinion, moving beyond um, public safety repairs, like large portions of the street are being recobbled um, right now. Um, and I know because Victor Brandon, or sorry, Victor of uh, Victor Brandon um, introduced himself to me and let me know that um, people have been asking for more and more of the street to be recobbled. So according to him, that is why he is recobbling more and more of the street right now. Um, they are setting everything in stone dust. That's the specification. You mentioned drainage. Um, do you have any comment on the material that these stones should be set in and how that might impact drainage? Yeah, so the, um, 
One thing you really want is, again, for the water to drain through well. Um, a lot of stone dust does not drain well, um, just because the particles are so fine and often because you have a, what would be called a, a well-graded um, rather than a uniformly graded material. So uniformly graded, you can imagine that if, if and greatly enlarged, all the particles are marbles. They're all about the same size. And then um, well graded would be, you know, you've got a mix of marbles and peas and, and BBs and things. And, and so the smaller things tend to fill in the voids between the larger things. So there's less void space for the water to, to migrate through. Um, so a lot of times stone dust is both fine and it's got enough variation in the particle size that the voids just are, are kind of filled in so it does not drain very well. So I, I think a, a better material would be um, kind of a, a uniformly graded like wash sand um, or, a, or even, you know, if they were kind of in the stone family, there are larger particle size stones like stone millings that drain a little better because the, the particles are a, a better size. Um, if I could share screen again for, for just a minute, I'll kind of go back to an image um, I had on one of the slides. Can people see that? Just maybe give a thumbs up if you can. Yeah, so you see this diagram at the left. This is from the the English paper talking about the, the Radcliffe camera paving that center photo. Um, and you know, the different layers, so you've got kind of the base and the sub base. Um, that, um, that top layer is really the trickiest one. So that number seven, because that one on one hand, you want something that water is gonna perk through and drain well. But on the other hand, that's the one that is most inclined to just kind of come loose. You know, you don't have anything, you don't have the stone or anything pinching it in. And you know, that's, that's a very tricky one. So that's the one I know there's been some discussion of a dirty sand and by dirty, what that means is uh, essentially it's got a little bit of clay in it uh, that helps kind of bind it together. And that's, that's essentially what you see on the right in that Italian photo. So that's from setting, uh, that's actually a, a city street in Rome being set. And you can see it's got that kind of uh, yellowy brown, warm brown uh, color to it because there is a little bit of, bit of clay in there, which looks a lot like the natural sand that you have in many areas of the island from some of the, the excavations I saw and some houses I walked by that were under construction where they were, where they were digging up around foundations. Um, but that, that top wear is, is often very tricky. But kind of another principle of uh, pavement design is if you look at that cross section on the left, once the water starts migrating through, you really want to give it a clear path down, um, all the way down. So you don't want to interrupt that drainage at, at any layer. So I know at one point there was some, there was a question, boy, well, you know, what if we did a contemporary bituminous road underneath and kind of just set the cobblestones on top for aesthetics. Um, but in that case, let's suppose that that number three was your bituminous road, you know, all the water would drop down to the top of that level and then it would sit there and then it would freeze up in the winter and then you'd have all the cobbles popping loose. So um, essentially as the, you want the permeability of the materials to be really good. And if anything, you want them to increase as you're going down. So you don't have a lens form where the water tends to linger, freeze, and then, and then pop paving up, forming pop, uh, potholes, excuse me. Thank you, Matthew. This is so incredibly helpful. It's, um, it is really exactly the sort of well-informed information I think is will be of use to the town. Um, the cobblestone road and the, the pavement are, you know, part of, part of an, an, an antique um, resource that we, that we need to protect. So having this information, I just, personally, I think everybody would agree is really, really valuable. Um, I do have one question. I know we have Dawn with us, um, and Dawn has let me know that she needs to drop off soon. Um, I mean, I, I have a, I, I guess I'm observing that there's a tremendous amount of repaving happening right now. It's labor intensive, expensive, and 
um, I just would like to see some of this advice um, considered and, and used. So I wondered, how can we do that? Um, do you have any reactions? What, what, what would be your advice? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, if it's happening right now, I'm not sure uh, what we can do to, to run out there. I, I know Rob seemed great and he was very uh, receptive to everything we talked about throughout the day and throughout the tour. And, um, you know, we, we actually talked a little bit about stone dust versus sand. And, you know, he said, if you could, if you could help us develop a spec for sand, you know, that would be that would be really helpful because I know people mentioned dirty sand, but I'm just not sure how you how you buy that with a procurable technical spec. And um, so happy happy to help and try to you know push the report out there. Or you know if if you want to have Rob give me a call or anything like that, I'm I'm happy to talk further too. That's that's great to know. Dawn, did you have any comment about this matter? Oh, um, I, I mean, I thought that the idea was um, the community foundation was going to grant this to the town as a gift. Is that the, the intent? Um, yeah, I mean, by having this public meeting and this preliminary report, this is the gift. <laughs> and we can find out whatever the best way to, to further communicate it. I mean, we're receiving the information and we can communicate it as appropriate. Well, really, it would be something that the select board needs to accept would be the proper process. So that would be my suggestion is that this gets put forward into the select board office um, and put put on for the town to accept it as a gift and incorporate it into the review, pro the review process with the DPW. Does that make sense, Holly? Y yes, it, it does. I, I would assume once we receive Matthew's final report that would be something to, to go before the, the select board for review and approval or acceptance i should say hillary I, my my comment has more to do with the repairs we're doing now we're using stone dust to the extent that we can get a technical spec matthew for dirty sand that rob could order and use in future, that would be very helpful. I'm to the extent that we're doing it now, I think it needed to be done. And so it is being done, but it's probably not gonna be the best long-term solution we have if we're using stone dust that compacts and then uh, uh, doesn't allow it to uh, really permeate the ground, then we'll go back and do that at some point in the future. But for whatever we have coming up, if we can develop a spec that does give Rob the right kind of material I mean, I'm certain there's a cost to it that obviously might be different than stone dust, but if that's the right thing to do for long-term sustainability of the roads, then I think we ought to, as soon as we can, try and figure out how to help him get the right material. Um, Matthew, can you comment on what would be involved with developing a spec, as, as Don suggests? Yeah. Um... I, th I think it would just be, you know, some research into um, what's available and, you know, how to specify it in terms of the, the ways that um, highway and DPW specs are typically written. So probably, you know, figuring out a way to find out what's available and then craft it into the language that the people who bid these projects are accustomed to reading and, and that they can procure it through their normal normal lines of pro procurement. Can I ask a question? Yes, hi, Brian. Hi, I'm sorry to jump in late. Um, I, I understand that, that all this is based on procurement and specifications, but the sand was dug on island and the, and the town owns a work yard. Wouldn't it be possible to identify the specification to say this is the, the character of this material and then just test some from a pit where it could just be taken from on island, no shipping, no importation, just go dig it. You know, I, I'd like to jump in with that. I, I think that is a very sound observation. I just want to say that the DPW, this is what they do. They develop specs for things and we can advise them about, you know, properties and observations, but ultimately the DPW needs to, 
you know, that's their job is to develop this deck and you can specify properties. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess what I'm, I'm just conscious of the time and wanting to move on. I'd like to suggest that we might summarize um, some of the recommendations that we've heard and put this together in an informational letter. I, I did it. Um, invite Rob to this meeting and he was uh, did accept the invitation but then something has come up and he wasn't able to attend um, otherwise I think he would have been very happy to be here but we can summarize the information in, in a letter um, you know observe that what the types of things we've discussed and send it to him and Holly you wanted to say something no, uh, yes um, oh sorry I, I just want to mention that from my conversations previously with Rob, and I think yours too, Hillary, that, that, that Rob as the director of DPW is very um, receptive to receiving um, historic goals for our streets. And, and he's being, you know, obviously very um, sensitive to, you know, the preservation of our streets. So I'm wondering, you know, I, I, obviously we don't want to rush the, the report. I know how diligent those, those take. Um, but at the same time, I'm wondering, Matthew, if there is a way um, to, to help, I, I guess, provide what, what exactly we should be, um, advising we as, as the historical commission advising the, um, DPW and, and the select board when it comes to our streets, um, something, and I don't know if that's something that you were incorporating within your final report, but the historic goals and identifying specifically what our goals are, I know that's something that, um, has, has been asked for, um, so. Georgia, did you want to say something? Yes, just quickly. I wanted to follow up on what Brian suggested and suggest that if the issue is defining a, uh, the nature of the sand, perhaps Mr. Bronski or whoever would do this could go out to that sand pit, pick it up and identify that and use that to define what the um, identifying documents should say as the kind of sand we want to, we want to get. I don't know if I'm making myself clear, but if you have to have a specification, go out and dig up the sand and use that to define the specification. I, and I completely agree with that, Georgia. I was just saying that, you know, we can define the recommended properties and the historic goals, but the DPW um, can, you know, they, they'll be the ones to dig up the sand and, and Matthew is offered to um, to consult with Rob and offer any advice. Um, so I'm hoping that they will do that. Brian? Hillary, can I, I, I don't mean to beat a dead horse. I think it would be a mistake though not to recommend using a local sand. One, because most of the sands that are available are all washed and so forth. You're trying to get the clay particles out. But secondly, if we're talking about sustainability and this is part of a reasonably you know, sustainable thing and climate change, I think it's an important part of the recommendation to say it was dug on island if Matthew could provide a specification to say, here are the, the qualities, the proportions of materials that are needed in it, and those are identifiable in a pit that can be dug, we, it, it, the Historical Commission may not be able to compel the DPW to do it, but they should make it clear that it is the simplest, most sustainable way to achieve this material. And then, obviously, that, at that point, you stop and they have to decide. So I, I will now go quiet on this issue. <laughs> oh, I hear you. And sustainability is a goal of our town. Um, sustainability, um, uh, resilience to, in the face of climate change is part of the goal of our town. So it's a point well taken, Brian, thank you. Uh, yes, Tom? Yeah, uh, in all the construction that I've ever been party to in the last 38 years on Nantucket, what Brian is talking about has always been described as hill sand. It's got the clay in it and it's got all the minerals that came down from Canada when uh, Nantucket was created 25,000 years ago. Thank you. So uh, could I, so I've suggested that um, we might summarize this uh, discussion and send a follow-up letter to Rob. Um, Holly has mentioned our historic goals, which Rob has asked for repeatedly. Um, and we've let him know that we will provide them in September. Um, Matthew, are we still on track to have, w w when do you think you'll have the final report? I will have it in September. I don't, I don't have an exact date yet. Okay. 
Fine. So, so we're on track with all of that. Um, the select board is on recess at this point. Um, I know um, one of the takeaways from the last meeting was that we would be back in front of the select board and um, maybe we can make this part of our, our, our presentation. I do want to note that I, um, before we started this project, I discussed it um, at length with Libby Gibson. Um, Ken Bogrand was also present for those meetings in just saying, well, you know, how do we do a gift? Do we need to make a gift? And she said, you know, you don't need to make a gift. You can just tell us the information. Um, so I, I will, you know, continue to be receptive to any comments technically about how to communicate this. But right now I'm working under the um, assumption that we will just, we, we've collected information that's being provided to us, um, paid for by somebody else, and we will present the information when we have it. And that's part of one part of what's happening in this public meeting. Um, so I, I'd like to just really thank you, Matthew, for this wonderful insight, this super informative presentation. Um, it's incredibly useful. And um, do I need to take a vote about sending a letter to the DPW? Um, Madam Chair, I, I would. I just want to, I'm, I'm just concerned on what exactly would that letter say prior to receiving Matthew's full report? Well, I think um, the letter would simply summarize the feedback, um, the preliminary feedback that we've gotten. Um, I think per Dawn's point, we would note that um, we have some concerns based on this feedback about the use of the stone dust. And, you know, we all have an interest, everyone, in, you know, doing this work in a way that will last. Um, and uh, I, th and that we'll, we'll be presenting the goal, re you know, re reaffirming that we'll be presenting the final report in September. Is there anything else the letter should say or any sensitivity that you're concerned about, Holly? No, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm just cautious on jumping the gun, if you will, but I understand the, the urgency um, because, you know, Matthew is the, the, the authority in, in this and, and I know his, his report um, will probably have a little bit more information in it too. Um, so I just, just wanted to, for clarity's sake, and that it's clear in this letter that the final report would be, be coming forward, but I understand the urgency. Okay. Um, could I have a motion? What are you looking for a motion for? I'm just looking for a motion to send a letter summarizing the conversation today um, to the DPW. So moved. Okay. Um, Second. Okay. Um, so all in favor, um, David? Oh, David, Aye. you seconded. Yeah, you're in favor of your motion. Um, are you in favor of your motion? Aye. Uh, Mickey? Yes. Uh, Clement? Yes. Don? Yes. Georgia? And sorry, Georgia, was that a yes? Yes, okay. And I am also in favor. Um, so Matthew, thank you so much. Um, you're welcome to hang out and talk about surveys with us if you would like, but we are gonna be moving on. Okay, thank you everyone. Thanks for having me today. Great. Thank, you. thank you, Matthew. Thank you. Bye-bye. So we are now uh, moving on. Um, we had an item <clears throat> which was the mission statement that was uh, I asked to be to be deferred until later on in the discussion. So Holly, I want to give the floor back to you um, to finish um, giving us the constructive criticism uh, that you wanted to offer with the understanding that we are not going to be getting into the details of the mission statement because it's not on our agenda. Correct. So from, from the feedback from the select board to um, emails from the public to discussions with my um, superior, the planning director, um, and, and also talking to, to Chris from um, MHC, this is my proposal and I obviously will send this out to everybody, um, obviously, um, because you all don't have it in front of you and, and this is just for to, to consideration. But to um, just to, to, to give you all the old one that we've had that was passed down from 
on the select board and I'm not privy to exactly when it was created, um, maybe in 2005 when uh, town meeting um, adopted the, the actual having a, a commission, but the old one said the Nantucket Historical Commission is the local historic preservation and archeology span planning and advocacy agency. The NHC creates educational opportunities, creates plans for preservation of Nantucket, advocates through the select board on issues of historic preservation and oversees state requirements for archeology. span um, I will mention that I think um, that the NHC's um, real um, benefit to Nantucket as a National Historic Landmark is definitely the um, surveys and archaeology aspect. Um, not necessarily the advocacy, because I think Nantucket is very fortunate to have the presence of the Nantucket Preservation Trust, Preservation Institute Nantucket through the University of Florida, the NHA. Um, I think we're very, very fortunate to have those organizations. So not necessarily an advocacy in that regard um, from, from a, a historic and, and preservation aspect. So, all right, my proposal is the Nantucket Historical Commission was created for the preservation, protection, and development of the historical and archeological assets of the Nantucket National Historic Landmark. In order to protect Nantucket, the NHC may make recommendations as is deemed necessary to the select board and the Massachusetts Historical Commission on preservation issues as allowed under MGL chapter 40, section 8B. The NHC complements the local historic district commission, which is Nantucket's regulatory Arch architectural review board. It also li liaises with local preservation and conservation nonprofits. Very short and sweet. Like I said, I will email that to everybody for your consideration. <clears throat> Holly, thank you for doing that. Um, so we'll put mission statement back on our agenda for um, September. I think if we're called to meet with the select board, we may need to meet, move our meeting so that we meet and discuss this a little bit before our presentation of the select board. Um, I do want to ask if I may, um, Chris, uh, since we have you there, could I ask you to just comment a little bit um, generally on the role of historical commissions, advocacy, um, bylaws. Um, and I, I just want to introduce everybody to Chris Skelly, who uh, works for the Massachusetts Historical Commission and is the liaison and the resource to local historical commissions. Okay. Sure, thanks Hillary. Uh, great, great to, be, great to hear, be here with you. Um, and uh, certainly hearing Matt's presentation was fascinating presentation. So I enjoyed, enjoyed sitting through that too. All right. Um, so yeah, uh, my role at Mass Historical Commission, for those of you that might not know me, is my title is Director of Local Government Programs. And that means I work with all of the local historical commissions and historic district commissions across the state. Um, so that's somewhere in the neighborhood of about 450 commissions in Massachusetts. Um, somewhere in the neighborhood of 3,000 or so volunteers that make up all those commissions. And my role is to try to help you as commissions um, do your job a little easier. Um, so I, I do that in a lot of different ways. Um, so some of you might be on our listserv. Um, there's a listserv uh, with about seven, 800 people around it. That's mostly made up of local commission members. Um, and so they ask each other questions and commission member from Eastern Mass might get a response from Western Mass, and it's just a great way to it's just a great way to have lots and lots of uh, volunteer commission members as well as professionals on the on the list, all having discussions. Uh, so I administer that, and then uh, lots of guidebooks that I put together for commissions. And then uh, certainly when I can, I come out and meet with commissions uh, regularly and hold regional workshops. Um, so one of the last ones I did. Uh, before pandemic was down in Dartmouth, uh, a demolition delay workshop held down there. So I just started doing some workshops um, online and I'm posting those on the listserv. So I held, an, I held a workshop yesterday um, uh, called, uh, it's, it's, it's the, basics, the basics for what local commissions do. It's called Introduction to Historic Preservation Planning. Uh, it's the one that's requested by far more than any other presentation. Um, so I do that one the most. Um, so I'm doing that online now. I'm doing that, uh, it'll be one next Thursday, one Thursday after that. And there's uh, 
interest, I'll keep I'll keep doing those online as well. So it's a it's a good workshop just because it, it does cover all the basics of what local commissions uh, do in Massachusetts. Okay, so back to Hillary's question, uh, sort of the role of historical commissions, historic district commissions. Uh, usually we can think of historic district commissions as having the design review aspect, administering their local bylaw when it comes to the local historic district. And then the historical commission doing uh, com what, we want, what I always say is community-wide historic preservation planning. Now, Nantucket's gonna be a little different in how this works. So let's picture every other place in Massachusetts where you've got maybe one, two, three, four, five local historic districts scattered throughout the town, maybe just in the village center, maybe in the three, three villages throughout the town, say in Acton, uh, Hingham has five local historic districts. So they're gonna have uh, that historic, that historic district commission is gonna be administering five different historic districts that are scattered throughout the town. And that's really going to be their main role is doing the the administration uh, design review for all the projects that are coming up uh, for applications in those districts. And that's why they also have a Hingham Historical Commission, which is doing community wide historic preservation planning throughout the rest of the town. And that's going to be community wide historic preservation planning is going to be all the identification, documenting historic resources, basically all the survey. Uh, historic property survey forms. It's going to be doing things like National Register uh, proposals, nominations. Uh, it's going to be doing some uh, public education outreach community-wide. Um, and yes, it's going to be doing advocacy as well in terms of advocating uh, for uh, um, issues, uh, is historic preservation issues uh, throughout, the, throughout the whole community. So in a place like Hingham, they have both. They have the Hingham Historical Commission and they have the Hingham Historic District Commission and that works really well there. If you went across the water to New Bedford, they're gonna have one commission. It's gonna be the New Bedford Historical Commission and they've taken on the roles of both things. New Bedford Historical Commission does design review in their local historic district, which is their, the waterfront area of New Bedford and they do community-wide historic preservation planning throughout the entire city of New Bedford. So the, the, the New Bedford Historic, Historical Commission is gonna be doing things like um, overseeing uh, survey projects in neighborhoods far, far away from the local historic district, um, proposals for new national register districts. Um, they have a demolition delay bylaw throughout the rest of the town, the rest of the city. Um, so they're going to be administering, the historical commission is going to be administering that demolition delay bylaw. So the, 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 their, their plate's pretty full in that case because they, they're taking on the roles of both historical commission and historic district commission. Uh, so that can work, that works really well in a place like New Bedford. They've, they're covering things really well. Um, they've, even though there's a lot, a lot of things on their agenda, they're able to do both. <clears throat> Where this, where this can break down somewhere sometimes is uh, in some cases that historic district commission. So I, have, I can think of a couple places that I've, I've talked to over the few years, past few years, <clears throat> where they have a combined historical commission and historic district commission. But really the commission is just doing design review in the local historic district and everything in the, in, in the rest of the community, things like things really important things like survey um, aren't getting done at all. So I've talked to historic district commissions <clears throat> that are serving as both that have no understanding of what survey is, no understanding of how you identify and document things throughout the whole community. So that's one of the problems that can come up when you have a combined commission. Um, on the other side, it can be a problem when you have both because it's confusing to the public to have both a historic district commission in a historical commission, so that's that can be confusing just because it's it needs to, you need to do lots of education in terms of what what the role of each of the commissions are, and then it's sometimes challenging in some of the communities um, because it's uh, just harder to find volunteers to serve on both a historic district commission and volunteers to serve on a historical commission. So a few places have actually 
that have had uh, two commissions in the past. Uh, some cities and towns recently have actually gone ahead and combined both combined both commissions because um, it's just it's just harder to harder to deal uh, it, uh, administratively and harder to find volunteers to serve on both commissions. So now we get in the Antucket, which is a little more complicated because your entire island is the local is the local historic district, um, and so that that's that's completely different than anywhere else in Massachusetts. Um, where you're really dealing with just local historic districts that are really just like the village center uh, or just one or two other places in the in the in the town um, because you're because the entire island is a local historic district uh, i can i can i can see there's going to be times where it's a little bit more challenging to think about how uh, what the what the role of both of those commissions going to be having a Nantucket historic district commission and having a Nantucket historical commission um, so I, I don't know how some of those things have been worked out in the past in terms of the two roles. I know you're talking about the MOU between the two for the CLG application, um, but that's, the, the, that's, there's not much to that MOU really. Um, so I, I would imagine um, the distinction there is, 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 is going to be, is going to be really important. And I don't, I, I'm not really sure how many of those discussions have already taken place in terms of how you distinguish yourself from historic district commission and, and, and work all those things out. Um, there have been some times I've just thought as I've looked through some of the mission statement things that I've thought um, almost more than a mission statement is, is there, you almost need like more of a preservation plan more than anything else because it's hard to understand that mission statement without understanding the context of both, how both commissions are working together. Um, and that made me just think, well, maybe a preservation plan would be, that would be one of the things to explore within a, hist within a historic preservation plan is, this is gonna be the role of the historic district commission and their list of things over here. Here's, in, here's, what's, here's, here's what's working really well in the historic district commission. Are there aspects of that that aren't working as well that uh, a historic dist historical commission could be taking on? Um, Maybe and I and I don't really want to I don't really want to take any positions on that. That's really going to be a local decision in terms of how all that how all that works together. Um, but certainly, I can um, I can imagine that judging by as Holly said, their what their agenda just for design review recently was five hours long. That there might be a, a reason to have a, a separate historical commission. That can be doing things like identifying and documenting, and really and really working on uh, comprehensively and uh, updating updating uh, all your all your survey across the island. Um, okay, what 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 else can I what else could I talk about here, Hillary? Um, well, thank you. I mean, that's incredibly helpful to have that statement um, to clarify some of these things. Um, I just want to um, say that. We are in the messy middle right now. You know, Nantucket has not, does not have a preservation plan. Um, we have a preservation planner for the first time ever in Holly who was appointed to her job in September and also has many other duties. Um, and uh, this is a time when we are, um, we are all trying to get on the same page to set goals, to define responsibility, to understand what is right and what isn't right. And I personally think this town is up to it. I think this commission is up to it. I think the historic district commission is up to it. And I think we all need to remember our better angels in um, keeping our eyes on the big goal, which is preserving this beautiful, rare, extraordinary resource of this historic landmark. Um, I absolutely will not allow um, lawyers hired by private interests who want carte blanche to do whatever they want in this historic district to define our role, our agenda. Um, I think that is defined by the town and by our commonwealth. Um, and this is a difficult time when people are trying to figure out, well, who does what and what's going on? And I want to make it very clear that we want to have that discussion. And we are looking for advice from the town, from the town council from the Massachusetts Historical Commission. Um, and this isn't gonna get resolved in this meeting today, but um, I hope that we can have more discussions in the right format. We'll consult with Holly, we'll consult with the select board and the town manager 
um, to figure out how to do that. Um, I would like to move on to discussing surveys, but uh, if there's any comments, um, I, we, we can't have a big discussion about our mission statement. It'll be on the next meeting. Yes, Holly. I just want to thank Chris because I uh, agree 100% that a preservation plan would be very, very helpful for Nantucket. Um, very familiar with you know what those entail, um, and I think I've you know I've I've mentioned that to the planning director before, and that would be some sort of you know addendum to the master plan um, because of course that's important. And I think I think what one of the challenges of under people understanding Nantucket in general when it comes to historic preservation and, and the history here is is really you know I've been an advocate for education and understanding what a local historic district is versus the NHL um, and so um, I've mentioned to both the, the commissions both the historical and the HDC that um, you know having that education is, is, is paramount and so I'm working with an um, in, in APC I actually have a um, a scheduled time to talk to both Marie and um, Stephanie um, at NAPC to bring the virtual um, training here. Um, I think it's imperative um, in that way. It's also open to you know our powers at B so they can understand um, a little bit more of, of what preservation is. But I agree 100% and I, I appreciate hearing it from you um, with your role at MHC and I appreciate you being here today. Thank you. I agree, thank you, uh, Chris. Um, okay, so uh, Chris, please stay for our discussion about surveys. Um, we, I, and I wanna emphasize that Holly is setting up our training. Holly, we don't have a date for our training yet, do we? We're looking at sometime in November, probably the early month of November, probably in between <laughs> election time and the, um, the holiday. Okay. And we will be hearing from Chris again for our training. Um, so uh, I think we all really want the training and are looking forward to the training. So um, thank you. Um, so Chris, thank you. If you're welcome to stay for the discussion of surveys. I'm sure you have a lot to advise us on about surveys, but I do want to move on. Um, we have some guests here. We have Michael May, um, Betsy Tyler, and um, a Brian Pfeiffer, who are all members of our NHC resources advisors. Um, and they're here to help us have a discussion um, about getting started with updating our surveys. Um, and I wanna emphasize that these surveys are for the island of Nantucket. They're not HDC surveys, they're not NHC surveys. Um, they will be part of the um, inventory of cultural resources in the Commonwealth. Um, and it's our uh, job and our big goal um, to start a process, to find a process and start getting a better and complete historical information about um, our structures, both privately owned structures and publicly owned structures. Um, so uh, Angus, or not Angus, um, Tom and Mickey and I had a little bit of a discussion about surveys um, Mickey had uh, put some thoughts together, which I shared in the packet. Holly, can you um, send, bring up that the phrase with the suggestions about surveys? Um, so in the packet, we have some thoughts about surveys. Um, and how we might get a start on this quite large task. Um, I also included, um, you know, we've had this discussion about the inventory forms. So I've included samples of um, what a lot of our forms look like. Now. A lot of the historical information that's in the MACRIS database looks like now. Um, I've also included um, an example of um, a completed Massachusetts inventory form for a historic structure. Um, full disclosure, the building in that um, inventory form is owned by me. I'm sitting in it right now. Um, I didn't have anything to do with preparing the survey. I probably should have chosen some other building as an example. It was just one that I happened to know was complete. Um, 
so I put it in there. Um, so, and then we also have just the blank inventory form. <clears throat> so that's all available to you to look through as context here. Um, so Mickey, do you want to talk a little bit about this um, suggestion that we all thought was a good suggestion to consider? Or would you like me to run through it? I'm happy to run through it. Why don't you, you outline it and I'll fill in as, as needed. Okay, okay, great. Um, so what this, uh, this is just a thought piece. I mean, this is not anything that's a policy. We're just having a discussion here. Um, but um, we wanted to observe that the process for review of all application to the HCC is totally their domain and any discussion about this process should openly include the HCC. We did have a member of the HTC, Stephen Welch, with us as a guest. Um, I know we had to drop off, um, but I do hope that we can discuss all of this with the HTC. Um, we certainly recognize their very important role here and their advice. Um, so this is just a start to help um, the, just frame the process. So our premise is that this Massachusetts Historical Commission inventory form B is an excellent resource for a thorough review of additions and alterations to historic structures, demolition of historic structures, and creating and completing the form B for all historic structures will take years to implement. So just as a point of reference, I think there's 2,895 um, structures in the uh, MACRIS database with a Nantucket ID number, and there's many more structures listed on the NHL data seat sheet. I mean, it's a, it's a tremendous um, quantity of structures to look at. Um, so it's gonna take a long time and we need to get our arms around how we're going to tackle this and in what ways. So we are proposing, and what we would like to discuss, I'm really glad that Chris is here as part of this discussion to advise us, that we might have an interim process that would allow for a thorough review of changes and additions to historic structures. And then we'll also simultaneously contribute to the inventory of structures which have completed um, MHC inventory form Bs. Um, so, uh, what we observed was that we currently, Nantucket currently has a checklist of what is required to be included in um, any application to the HDC for addition or demolition or partial demolition. Um, and what happens is that uh, the, the information is, is submitted and the, um, the historic information may or may not be included and is included to, with various um, degrees of accuracy. Um, and we don't currently have the staff on Nantucket to go and complete all of these, you know, form these on a reactive basis. And Holly is like shaking her head, no, we absolutely don't. Um, you know, if a building comes up for an application and it is especially sensitive, I know that Holly reaches out to the Nantucket Preservation Trust um, for help, or she might decide, you know, this is really important, I need to, to do some research and assist the HDC. I've personally seen um, structures, you know, come before the HDC and have discussions about, well, is this contributing? You know, the survey says no, the 30-year-old survey says no, um, but there's not a lot known, and that's kind of the end of the discussion. So what we wanted to talk about, and I, I just want to preface that um, I'm not trying to minimize, I, we're, we're recognizing the importance of professionals completing the surveys, and I'm very pleased that we have some professionals um, from our um, resource advisors here to talk about this and talk about what's involved with preparing these surveys. Um, but we, we just wanted to put out there for feedback and discussion, could there be a system that we might just present or recommend, you know, this will only be for us to recommend, we wouldn't actually implement it, that applications are reviewed when received to make sure that they include historic survey form and return if they do not, if it's, you know, warranted based on the project. Um, that all applications would first go to the preservation planner for comments and then to the advisory boards. That the advisory boards could ask the applicant to provide more information, including the original construction and subsequent addition dates, the ownership history, the sample map history, the advisory boards could also, and this would be new, I mean, uh, this is already what happens. This is not new. But what would be new 
is that the advisory boards would ask the applicant to provide a form B that has been produced by a qualified professional. And we can talk about, you know, could we help, could we provide information that could be used at the applicant's um, discretion to help them connect with a qualified professional, provide an example of what, you know, what we mean by historical information. Um, that each time the applicant submits a revision, the advisory board would re review this prior to the HCC review. And if changes are recommended, the changes would be sent back to the advisory board before the HCC votes for approval. Um, some of the, so uh, Mickey also pointed out, and I thought this was very interesting because there's so much discussion on Nantucket about whether a, 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 um, a, a structure is contributing or non-contributing is a really foreign term to a lot of people. And the form B does not include a checkbox regarding contributing or non-contributing, whereas the old surveys um, from 1989 actually did have that. I didn't know what to make of that, um, looking for feedback on that. Um, but that's, that's kind of where what, what we observe is that this historic information is important. It is necessary for the HCC and the advisory boards to make a determination about um, the appropriateness. Um, <clears throat> these um, applications are coming up all the time. Scores of them every month are coming up. Um, and could we um, somehow consider a different way of doing things? Um, I'd love to hear any additional information from Mickey. Um, and I'd love to hear from anyone to discuss this idea and what we should do with, with these thoughts, if anything. I think I, um, I'd probably just add to that, that um, obviously this is all um, up to the HDC. They have to buy into the fact that these forms are important and um, that they're gonna use them as a, as a you know, major part of what their review process. And you know, another, another aspect of this is that we, there needs to be a, the resource out there. There needs to be the group of people that that are qualified professionals that can they can put these forms together um, and then i guess the hdc needs to allow the boards to be able to or even holly for that matter to request these forms during the application process I'm happy to say a few things. I'm happy to say a few things if you'd like, Hillary. Yeah. Let's hear, Chris. What would you, um, what would your feedback or advice be? Okay. Um, sure. Cert certainly, the important. I, I would stress the importance of having good survey for the HDC to be able to do their design review. That's always something that I would encourage for all of the local historic district commissions that I work with. Um, just having that good background information puts you in a much, much better position to be able to properly um, deliberate and, and make a decision on, on, any, on any changes to that property. Um, I'm, I'm not really sure how that would work in terms of having the application be uh, contingent on having a, a survey form prepared. Um, I, I, I can't think of any place in Massachusetts that does that. I think they'd probably be interested to find out if there's any examples nationwide that would require that. And I, uh, and I'm, I wasn't clear from the descriptions of how, if they don't, if, if, there, if an application comes in and you don't have a survey form and it needs to be done by a qualified professional, where are those qualified professionals already on island and how is the, how is the funding then going to be done to hire that consultant or professional to then prepare that form? Seems like that I'm not I'm not clear on how that would work um, in in your in your proposed process. Uh, and the other thing I, I just wanted to point out, you had asked about there's no checkbox for contributing non contributing on our MHC form Bs. That is because uh submittal to our office and acceptance of our office of one of those form b's is not a statement of significance so just because we've 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 included that form b 
into our files in Boston does not mean we're making any kind of a statement on the eligibility of that property or the National Register or anything on its significance. So um, this is, I actually talk about this in the introduction, in the introduction to historic preservation planning workshop, I, I, I actually try to get this point across. Um, so we have, we have, inventory, we have, we have these survey forms in our office for buildings that were, were constructed in the 1980s. So, um, you know, not, they're not, they're not significant. I mean, we can, we can, we can look at the form and go, okay, yeah, not a significant property. Uh, it's there because we're identifying and documenting historic resources statewide and somebody submits a form, a form locally uh, and it goes, it goes into our files. We really think about identifying and documenting historic resources community-wide and then there's a next step. There's a next step of call it the evaluation process. And it's only after in that step where we really look and see, um, are these things, do, do these things actually have significance based on the National Register cri criteria? So that's not necessarily how other states do it, but that's definitely how we, we've always done it in Massachusetts. And I, and I think it's actually the best way to, I think it's actually the best approach. So that way you can, you, you have a nice clear distinction that you're just documenting things over here. And then there's a next approach to say, okay, well, what, of all those things that we've now documented, what sort of stands out? What's, what, what, what's standing out here uh, as, meeting, as meeting the level of significance for say National Register? And how does that evaluation process typically occur um, as a best practice? Who does it? When does it happen? Um, sure. So our office at, at the MHC staff level, we do National Register uh, eligibility opinions regularly, every couple weeks usually. Um, and we'll, so we're using the National Register criteria um, for our evaluations on whether something's eligible for the National Register. Does it meet that, that level of significance? But you can download the National Register criteria yourself um, from the National Park Service and do your own National Register evaluations on whether you think it's eligible for the National Register. Right, but there's a difference between if something is, um, if there, so there's a difference between if there are architectural features that are worth preserving um, because of historical significance or other significance and national register significance. I mean. um, was that a question? I'm not quite sure what the question is. Well, was. I guess my question is um, how, there's, there are different levels of evaluation and different levels of importance of structures. So on Nantucket, um, we have an HTC that considers how something is appropriate within the um, district, and that's even you know the appropriateness of new structures. But then there's also the question of um, are we losing historic material through demolition or by altering the structure beyond recognition? Are we suffering a loss, and should this be? prevented from happening or, you know, working with an applicant to achieve their goals in a way that's more sensitive in the environment. And that requires an understanding of the contribution that the building makes. So we use this term contributing, but we're not evaluating a building for being on the National Register. Just because a building would not be eligible for the National Register doesn't mean it doesn't have contributing fact features that should be preserved. At least that's my approach. So I guess I'm understand I'm trying to figure out how this um, evaluation process you mentioned that's separate from the survey would fit in the context of a historic district like Nantucket and the types of applications that, that the RHDC is seeing. Brian, did you want to comment? Yeah, I, I think if I could go back and be a little bit long-winded, you can cut me off when you've had enough. Um, I think this is absolutely long overdue for Nantucket to have, it doesn't really have a preservation plan because the information is so spotty. There's some buildings that are very well known. Those tend to be the iconic buildings, and there are lots of other buildings that aren't well documented. The old forms are just sort of windshield surveys in many cases. So th there's no consistent basis for making decisions. There is also this constant misunderstanding between what the National Historic Landmark District does and the local district. And where it really comes into play in, in one of the more devastating ways is with more recent buildings. The, the 
the, uh, there was a very specific rationale used in the revision of the National Historic Landmark, which may or may not serve the Historic District Commission, but it, it hasn't, I don't think, ever been addressed specifically saying we accept that rationale the Landmark Program promoted, or we reject it and we're going to do something else. And so there's a kind of vague 50-year cutoff with no criteria, no way of saying what is the meaning of this structure. It's, it's, it's sort of one by one. My concern um, with the imposing of the obligation on the owners to prepare the form is, the forms are several fold. And I, please don't think I'm just here to harpoon. Um, I think the information is absolutely essential, but it's, and it's not there. One is that when you set that up, for the, those of bad faith, you set them up to seek a, a, a bag job. And there are people who will you know, aim the research at saying this is no value. On Ireland, there's no, to my knowledge, and I'm happy to be corrected, there's no architectural historian on Ireland who understands building conservation, who applies the standards, say here are the features, here's the group of things. It, it devolves into the arguing of one or two details or, or some other thing. So that there's that question of expertise. And fundamentally, it's a town's obligation in planning to know what it's trying to protect. So, it's farming this out to owners who may or may not fall, who may or may not be able to do a good job, or who may or may not be able to find a consultant if they're willing to pay for it to develop the thing. So the, the material is absolutely needed, and I don't have a great answer as to how to get there. Um, but I do have concerns about farming it out one by one, because even if every person who made an application produced a terrific Form B, well-researched, well-understood, well-argued, it's still anecdotal because you're just getting the buildings that people work, are working on at that moment. And it leaves this kind of qualified superlative. That this is the only, this side of the other thing, which turns out not to when you look at the whole town. So in some ways, I, the, the list that was developed for the National Historic Landmark Program is identified as contributing and non-contributing. It is not perfect. There are too many properties. There will be errors and missing things, but that does provide at least a defined basis for starting to identify what contributes to the district. And I don't know whether it's worth trying to kind of make that the discussion point and say, first of all, does this premise get accepted by the HDC and the Historical Commission? Or if not, what's missing? How does that get shaped? I'm sorry, I've kind of wandered through a bunch of things. I don't know if that's helpful or just confusing. Um, can I just comment? Michael. Um, I, I agree with you, Brian. I think that um, there's always been real confusion between the NHL inventory um, and then this 1985 inventory, and it's been been used. Um, it's been a battle. Um, so using the NHA makes a lot of sense. It doesn't mean that something built in 1970 that's listed as contributing can't be changed. More research needs to be done on it. Um, and I think that's, I, I think you're right. You use it as a base and then you do, you have that research um, completed or you, uh, and say, you know, this house has changed dramatically. There's nothing left of it. Um, so it's, it, it, like you say, it's not perfect, but it is uh, at least a baseline. Um, and that's how it should be used. Um, I think when, I think that uh, the Historic District Commission gets them um, you know, hot water sometimes when um, there isn't enough information. I mean, there's been some um, 20th century buildings that were really important. Um, there was no survey done in the 1980s. Um, so doing that research is really critical. Um, and I think that um, using the using the NHL, NHL database then makes a lot of sense. So if it is, says it is contributing, do more, more, more research if it's a 20th century building. And I think it's really the 20th century buildings that is the problem. It's not the 18th or 19th century buildings where we get into hot water. Um, but um, if the NHDC always wants more information. That's what, when I work for NPT and I know Mary continues, um, that we try to, try to provide that information when we can. Um, it can it's difficult. I, I completely agree with what Michael said. One of the things that concerns me is the political implication that if everybody who makes an application has to do a Form B, even for a building that's clearly not going to be contributing, you, you're, you're out there really getting a lot of people annoyed. If, if the HDC and the Historic, Historic Commission decide that they would use the 
NHL contributing list as a basis, then an application, which I assume comes to Holly, she could check the building on that list and say, you know, this is a building from 1983. It's not a contributing structure. We don't need an, a form B from you. Or conversely, this is a building from 1970, which is marked as contributing. So we probably do need to know more about it. It would at least, it would shave off those that, it would, it would stop people who don't need to prepare a form from going through the trouble of preparing a form only to be told, oh, it's clear your building doesn't contribute. And that's, that's one thing that would concern me because I think you'll earn a lot of annoyance. So what, um, and I, I though all of these points really resonate with me. Um, before I respond anymore, I just want to invite um, other commissioners uh, to comment, um, or Mary, if you want to chime in. Yeah. Um, I think that, and Chris, I feel like I might have seen this at the demolition delay workshop that there were some communities where they had people fill out a form B if they were submitting an application for demolition. Um, no? Um, no, I'm not aware of any that, that, that require a form B as part of an application process. Okay. For demolition? Just in particular? Yeah, where it's where it's contingent. I mean, the commission might. Think, well, yeah. I, I think that's what that's probably what I said. Um, when an application for 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 demolition has come in, the commission then hires a consultant to go out and do the form. I think right. that that's that seems like a a, a a nice clear process that way. Yes, I could see value there if it's something where you you feel like you're gonna you want to document a resource before it might be gone. Um, yeah, and it's also, used as, it's also used as a way to, it's also used a way in their process of um, deciding whether, um, it's I mean, significant. You know, whether it's significant or preferably preserved as part of their, their demolition delay bylaw. So that in that case, the commission has enough of a budget that they can go hire somebody quickly um, to go out and do the, let's say they have one demolition a year, uh, one demolition a month or something, they can hire a consultant once, once a month to go out and do that form if there isn't one already prepared. Um, I mean, just knowing how large your agendas are on, on Nantucket, um, I don't, I don't, I don't know whether that's going to be viable. Um, I mean, if, if anyone like talk to you about the, uh, yeah, go ahead. I don't know. Well, it sounds like it's the sort of thing, and I think Holly and I had discussed this just in passing the idea of, well, do you, what do you do? You raise the permit fees to try to cover the cost of something like that, or or what? It, what are the? Mm. I guess it's yeah. another topic, but yeah. Well, I think what we are trying to get at is, you know, right now we have a situation where the information, if it's not provided by the applicant, is often just absent, and decisions are being made without the information. I mean, imagine a situation where, um, you know, the applicant said, oh, well, I don't have any architectural drawings, but I'm just going to talk to you about what I'm going to build and would expect, you know, a, a well-informed, um, you know, building permit to be issued. So I, I don't think it's, I, I, I don't think we should be satisfied with the idea that, well, if the information isn't available, you know, we'll just do our best and muddle through. I'd like to get to a point where we have some way of getting the information or ex at least examining the, the process that, it, you know, making some kind of um, active decision about, is it okay uh, to not have this information? If not, how can we get the information? When can we get the information? What really is the best that we can do? So I certainly think figuring out, I, I'm really hearing that this needs to be born by the town. It's a municipal function. Um, and I really appreciate that. So I think um, I'd like to suggest that maybe we abandon this idea of having the applicant be asked to go get it um, because you've got some pretty clear advice that that's not a good idea and we have unintended consequences. Um, but the discussion of, well, then how else do we do it um, is, is really a, a very good one. Can I hear from other commissioners about that uh, thought? 
Uh, Holly, you wanted to say something? Yes, thank you. Um, I just wanted to let those that may not know, um, since my role in November started of, of working with the HCC, uh, I review all the applications before the HTC in both the local historic districts and then anything other that's scattered throughout that might be historic um, that are on the, in the NHL. Um, and I look at whatever we have available as a HDC survey and I look at the NHL um, data, uh, understanding that I've even found issues and I know it's not 100% accurate and I let the commission know you know, I have this, this information and this information, and that's provided not only to the commission, but also through the historic advisory boards. And I know both um, Angus and Mickey can, can vouch that. I provide that information where it's um, provided. It's, it's very difficult with the um, amount of applications that come through the office that um, they can be um, required by the applicant. Yes, in a perfect world, every applicant's gonna provide that information they not necessarily don't. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't fill it on the application, regardless. But I think really, I, I, and I, I greatly appreciate having both Chris and Brian and Mickey and Mary included in this conversation. I, I think it was, it's, it's well, well overdue. Um, I think the HDC has been very receptive of receiving information, especially through staff. I think that's very, um, I think that that's a great thing, but having the there's there's a there's a um, kind of I'm sorry I got so many things going in my head because this is great. There's a role for both commissions to work together to um, to figure out these these concerns. HDC is so busy that they don't they don't have the capability to be able to do the the planning aspect. So that's where you all come in. Um, they acknowledge, I think even town admin and, and the planning director have acknowledged that our HTC surveys are outdated. Um, you know, we've tried to put it in into town uh, budget for the town meeting that, that got cut out because of the COVID scenario that we're in right now. Um, there are mechanisms out there. Obviously the CLG would be a fantastic route um, to, to do that, to, to get the funding, to update the surveys. Even CPC funding would, would be something that um, to, to look into. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm very, very concerned on um, putting this onerous on an applicant to provide the form B. Um, I, I think we, looking back at, at doing maybe a preservation plan would be the, the first course of action. Um, Chris, I, I don't know if you can, what you in, in on the, on the high end level, what you would recommend preservation plan, CLG. It almost seems like they kind of need to go maybe CLG and then preservation plan in order to, to have these mutual priorities for both commissions. Um, there, you know, there's, there's a lot going on. I, I will say this, that um, I think I, it has been beneficial for the commission to have um, my role in, in help facilitating um, these these applications. There is a lot of information out there, I think, but it's not all of it is is it in one location. It's not an end all be all, and that's where I can go. Hey, Mary, you know, does MPT have anything on this? There's some things I remember from my time in MPT as a kid in, in high school. <laughs> so um, I, I know there's a lot of information. I, I know that there, that the MPT has done information over the years. I know Betsy's done a lot of information, Michael, there, Brian, I mean, there's so much information that's out there. It's just not in just a little, here it is for each home. Um, there's books. I, I, I look at Clay Lancaster's every day. I, I look at Chanley Foreman's every day. There's so much information, um, folks. There's, there's all these old historians that have, have come to Nantucket, have done this research, and it's there. It's just trying to get it all together to be beneficial for this island through what we all, you know, we all appreciate this place. So sorry, I, I had to get on my, my soapbox for a minute. Brian? Yes, I, if I could, I, I would like to go back to something that Mary mentioned, which is, and, and Aunt Holly, you would know more about this than I do, is it's a political question, but Having how many applications are there per month to the HDC? Just roughly, Holly, the order of magnitude. Uh, well, we can re we've received since the pandemic recently eighty in a week. Okay, um, I'm just thinking. But then, 
flush out probably about 20 of them located in, in, in either or of the local historic districts. If, if, if it were a political possibility to add to the, the filing fee for a building permit a certain amount, if you spread the cost of survey out over 80 buildings coming in a week, not all of them are going to need it, but you, would, you could generate with not a terrible increase in fee enough of a fund that the HDC or the Historical Commission would be able to say we need quick information on the following and maybe have somebody you know, on a contract or somebody who can quickly run down the basic information and, and allow decisions to be made fairly quickly or even to build toward a fund of saying, you know, in the long run, really what Nantucket needs is a good, thorough, start to finish survey again to rethink all these pieces to identify the missing parts. You know, obviously you can't stop decision making for four years while you do that. But I, I do think that possibly asking the town to, to create part of a permit fee that goes to this purpose would then allow some funds to start to answer these questions, at least in the present, while you're juggling these things rolling in at you. Because I, I agree with Holly, a lot of information is available, um, but it takes some time to track it down. Um, and I think for, for if you had an intern or if you had somebody who was just on contract to do this, you know, Betsy certainly knows the sources. I know some of them, Michael knows some of them. I think it'd be quite easy to develop a kind of quick standard bibliography. When, a, when you have a question about building, here are the sources you consult. This yields up some basic information. From there, you know, we, need, we really need to follow this more deeply or no, this is not actually the thing we thought it was. But some way to get that intelligent cut more than, I think, not to lambaste anybody, but too much was now is it looks like it's old to me. I like it. I don't like it. The basis for decision making just isn't there because, as you point out, Hillary, the information isn't there. These, these survey forms are woefully under researched and out of date. But I don't know, is that a possible thing, or would the town just shut you down and say, No, where are we adding to the fees for this purpose? I, I think it would be something to ask, definitely, with the um, understanding that obviously it's at the political will, like you mentioned. Um, but it, I don't think it would hurt to ask. Yeah, Hillary, could I? Yeah, um, yeah, I just want to say I like Brian's idea potentially of putting it on, uh, spreading it over all the permits and a small increase in permit fee. The other way to think about it again is: is this a really a, a budget item for the town? I know they cut it, Holly. You mentioned, but everybody on the island uh, benefits if we do this the right way and preserve the historical assets of Nantucket. Not just the people who are asking for the um, the, the change or the modification to their building. So everybody benefits if we do a good job of maintaining the standards that we need to preserve all the assets on the island. So to me, that it is a general budget item, not a person who, I don't, I don't want to put the, bur the burden on the person who wants to buy a home and have, be the only one that has to worry about the protection. It's really the town. And if it's a town, to me, it's, I, we can certainly do it through permit fees and it goes directly to folks who are doing the work, but it is for the benefit of the entire town. So I, I would go back to the select, selectman and say, uh, I really think it's, it's a budget item that shouldn't be cut because it does help everyone in town and on the island to preserve the assets and resources. Yes. And they, the, use that, they use that as appropriately. That's how I think about it anyway. It was included in this, this year's yeah. budget, but due to the restrictions with COVID and the condensed down town meeting, it was taken out uh, along with, with a few other things, some positions within plus. So it wasn't just that. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's understood that this is a need. Um, and, and this is why I am a proponent for the certified local government. Um, I've always thought since I was a kid that it was really strange that Nantucket was never included um, as a certified local government, to be honest with you. Um, but then there's federal funding that we could go out after a, as a CLG um, that I think, you know, everybody would be, both be appreciative of. And as well as, you know, admin, they have the, a duty, obviously, to make sure, you know, great, that's fantastic. How is it going to be paid for? Um, why do you think um, all the time from my role as a hazard mitigation plan coordinator, I'm, I'm trying to see what the fundings we have to make sure we can implement those priorities in the HMP. Um, and it's great when they, they merge in with the preservation and, and here lately, that's the, the course that we've been, been going on. But I digressed on that, but yes, um, 
I, I, it definitely um, has been acknowledged as a budget item. So I um, thank you. This is a fantastic dis discussion. So everybody who's participated, thank you. I just want to make an attempt to kind of summarize what we're hearing and propose and make sure we hear from everybody else and propose a path forward. Um, so I think we're hearing uh, two, we're talking about two different um, way, two different things. One is um, our uh, interest in surveying our historic resources as part of a proactive plan where we have um, funding, some of which will, will, which will be um, federal or state funding for which we will apply, some of it which will be provided um, for the town of the type that was included in the budget and unfortunately um, it was cut but hopefully will be put back. Um, and this will be uh, for hiring consultants who can complete Massachusetts Historical Commission inventory forms um, to document historic resources. The second uh, thing that we're talking about are, is the evaluation process that Chris mentioned, where when an application comes to the HTC for a demolition, partial demolition, a um, significant addition or reconstruction of a building, the evaluation that our town engages in both through staff and through volunteer commissions to um, assess the contributing nature of the structure or these features that are being asked to be changed. And what I'm hearing is that this falls, this responsibility falls firmly <clears throat> on the town. <clears throat> the applicant can provide information, but really the responsibility for making that evaluation falls firmly on the town. It's a, <clears throat> a municipal function. It should not be paid for by the applicant um, because uh, there could be unintended consequences of that. Um, so that being said, I just want to I have some comments for path forward and more kind of synthesis of this issue that we're trying to wrangle with, but I just want to go through the commission and get everybody's reactions um, to the discussion. David, did you want to make any comments? I'm here. I've just been uh, trying to take notes as, as we've gone through this. I appreciate everyone's input, trying to juggle a million different things. So uh, I'll, I'll abstain from commenting at this time, but uh, We'll, we'll make sure that I specify um, today's discussion in the notes. Thanks. Um, Nikki. Um, yeah, I, I'm, and I'm certainly hearing the, the, um, the concern that having the applicant pay for the survey has, you know, possibly negative connotations and implications. I mean, it's, it's similar to what's already being done when they hire an engineer to say that the building needs to be torn down. So it, it, I mean, it could be looked at with that kind of a, ability to have the bias there. Um, I think the only advantage to having the applicant do it is that it'll be cheaper for the town and it might get done a little quicker. Um, but obviously there are serious concerns about, um, you know, what's, whether that's appropriate or not. So I think the, the when I think it was Brian that mentioned raising the permit fees to create a fund um, so the town can hire these on an individual basis in the interim before an entire survey is done. Um, I think that's a, that's a great suggestion and um, that, that could get us started in this process. Okay, thank you, Clement. It seems to me that everyone agrees that a general survey is in order, that we are um, late in get having one, the other one's outdated. We need to update um, all of our historic district on the survey, building by building. But having said that, right now, what comes up is whatever the HTC is receiving from a new purchaser or old purchaser who wants to change their building. So we're, we're dealing, it's almost like a firestorm. You deal with the first people who want change and you don't want to, you know, every, I, I'm out in Wisconsin and, and on the SAB. And as Holly says, she does as much um, 
historical research as she can when something comes up for the SAB to look at. And she provides photos and whatever she can do. Her time is limited, unfortunately, because we rely on her a lot to get this done. Um, it, it, you're always dealing with it at the last minute when something is for sale or is going to be demolished and you know it's just flat on your table right then. Um, HDC does look at what the advisory boards submit to them while they are looking at it um, and they do I believe that they do because they want the guidance. So it seems as if this is this is two different things. We, we want a whole island wild survey of historic district of historic buildings. We also need immediate guidance for a building that's being proposed to be changed or demolished. Um, having the applicant do the form B, I, I mean, I agree with Mickey when he said they're going to get somebody who says it's a piece of junk um, if, if asked to fill out the form B. So where the funding comes from, I don't know. I mean, the applications when they come to the HDC are quite substantial, most of them. You know, they have to tell exactly what they want to do and they have to submit the architectural drawings. And um, I don't think we can ask them to, to do the Form B and I don't think it would help us. Um, so I, I just see sort of two things here. We need funding to do an entire survey and we need um, and we need somehow to shore up the the immediacy of people asking for change. I'm not sure Hillary once again will okay we'll make all of this <laughs> make sense. Okay. Thank you Clement. Um, Georgia? I, I'm, it's interesting because I'm not I'm not quite clear why this um, I'm, I, I disagree with you a little bit Clement I'm not quite clear why this application to the HDC cannot be uh, cannot be uh, the form B requirement can't be put on the applicant I know it's a big application as it is they have to have an engineer as uh, as um, Mickey says the engineer is going to say the building is a piece of junk but the contrary opinion of the historic architect is going to be it's contributing it's important it's not a piece of junk and we have to preserve it and i don't see why that obligation if we there are qualified professionals maybe we can get brian down here more often um why that obligation can't be put back on the applicant and and i don't understand why it has to be a town responsibility that seems to be more like a political decision than a, than a logistical decision but if it is a town responsibility, then it seems to me it goes more to getting us into a, a certified local government so we can get funding for it. Because as soon as you say something is a town responsibility, you bump up against who's going to pay for it. So why don't we try to make that yet another re uh, reason for advancing the certified local government process or speeding it up? Another political process, I know. Okay, thank you, Georgia. I can see Brian wants to say something, but Brian, I'm just going to ask all the commissioners to speak. I, I just have one comment. Okay. Okay, um, Tom, did you? No, I have no comment. Okay, do you, well, do you want to indicate any sort of general agreement or concern or anything? No, uh, my reason for not commenting is uh, I may have a conflict here, so I'm going to Okay, comment. fair enough. Um, uh, Angus. Angus, can you hear us? Okay, it, it looks like we may have lost Angus, but I'm sure we'll... Hillary, you're on mute. Brian, did you want to make a comment uh, in response it, to something you want to say? It's just anecdotal um, to the comment that Georgia made. The, the hard thing about having the, the proponent prepare this is because of the demolition delay ordinances that are now passed around the state, I get a fairly steady number of calls from people who have had a property put on delay because it, it seems historic and they want information prepared and they've been given my name and I always tell them the same thing. 
I'll come out and do an abbreviated conditions assessment. If you have historical information, I'll look at that, I'll prepare some, but understand that I'm gonna evaluate the building and you may not like the outcome. I may conclude the building is in fact an historic building. That shakes slightly less than half the people who call me out of the tree. So there are plenty of people who say, no, I really want the answer. I don't wanna pull a fast one, I wanna understand the building. And there are others who think, well, I really don't have much time for you, let me move on. So I think it is a steady and present danger, and particularly in places where property values are high and egos are even higher. And I think Nantucket has both of those situations. So I, I'd be very wary of finding you've got a couple series of hired guns who show up constantly saying, it's a piece of junk, it's not salvageable. Yeah, it does seem to me that, thank you, Brian, that we, you know, we've heard from Chris, we've heard from Brian, we've heard from Mary, and we've heard from Michael and Holly that um, the uh, this evaluation process should be separate from the application process. And in an ideal world, we would have all of our buildings surveyed so that the information were available to just be printed out and provided to the HTC for their evaluation process. But right now we don't have that and we still have this evaluation process going forward without the information. And that's kind of the problem, the gap, the gap that we're trying to address. Um, so I, I want to just contribute to this discussion, the fact that um, permitting fees are supposed to cover the expenses of a town in administering the functions of the town for the public good. And to the extent that we don't have, to the extent that all of these things <clears throat> are done, you know, as far as inspections, electrical inspections, plumbing inspections, building inspections, they really are all paid for by the applicant. It's just that they're paid for through fees that the applicant pays indirectly, whether you need the service or not, you as an applicant pay a fee. And I don't know, maybe this is a question for Chris, if your entire town happens to be in a historic district, are these kinds of, you know, collecting the information that is needed for historical work as pertains to the building and changes and construction and permitting, is that also able in Massachusetts to be paid for as part of these building fees, building permit fees? I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, but I think it's worth pursuing. I think if, if you are going to uh, pursue trying to get a, a, a survey form put together at the time of an application, um, that would seem like the best way to do it would just be that to have the fee the fee cover that cover that as well, and that uh, then that's that's going to be paid for um, through the town um, as part of, as part of the fee to get that to get that survey done. I think uh, so I, I don't think I can answer that question, but I, I, it's, it, it seems like it's worth pursuing um, pursuing that way. The other thing I, I would just mention while, I, while, I, while, while I'm on right now, um, so there's been a couple things on, on the CLG program. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's definitely worth pursuing, and I, I think I would try to get your CLG application in as soon as possible. Um, so just to be clear, uh, when you are a CLG, uh, you're then applying for our annual program, um, our, our annual grant program, and you stand a much higher chance of getting funded for, say, survey work, because 10% of the funds that come to our office from the National Park Service have to go to the CLGs. So um, I'll give you, say, Medford, the city of Medford, just outside Boston, and the town of Marblehead on the North Shore, um, both places with local historic districts, um, both places that had very, very outstanding serving needs, high needs for just really outdated survey. Um, and both became CLGs within the last few years and have been applying repeatedly each year to get a little bit more survey done year after year after year. The other thing that they did, um, which we would recommend, we talked about preservation plans, but we didn't talk about survey plans. And we really encourage uh, when, when the survey task at hand is so huge, as it was for the city of Medford, and as it was for the town of Marblehead, to think about doing a survey plan first. 
that really helps you prioritize this overwhelming task of getting all these survey forms prepared by a consult by a professional and really tries to think about, okay, well, these are the ones that we should apply for, um, for get, get done this year, next year, the following year, the following year. So yeah, I, I would think about a survey plan for you. And, and actually that can be applied for through the, the CLG program as well. That's great. And even if we're not a CLG, we can still apply for these funds, right? Depends on, depends on the year. Um, lots of years we have funds available for non-CLGs and CLGs. Sometimes our funds are limited and they're only available to CLGs. Um, so yeah, it, it, it would depend. And when will you uh, expect that announcement to be made for this coming fiscal year and this coming grant cycle? That's like October, November, um, okay. that the cycle starts. Okay. Well, um, I do think, you know, we're ready to make the application. We just need the uh, HTC to sign off on this quite lightweight MOU, as you said. Um, so I hope that this, you know, messy middle that I referred to in this bigger discussion about who does what doesn't have to interfere with you know, executing this administrative function, but that's really in Holly's hands and in the hands of the select board right now. I don't really know if there's anything else we can do because we haven't had any comment um, from the HTC. So, but I love this suggestion of a survey plan. I wasn't aware with it, uh, of it. It completely resonates with my idea because a preservation plan is so huge and really we need to get started on these surveys. So um, thank you for that. <laughs> Hillary, I just, I just want to mention that's kind of where I was. Sorry, 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 before we continue, I did get a message from Angus. He said that he wanted to speak, but somehow he can't unmute himself. So could you um, maybe, like, I don't know, disconnect him or try to unmute him? Oh, you're muted, Holly. I hit the button asked to unmute. So I don't know if that's on his side or that's you know, all I can do. The other option is that um, you could call in with the phone. The dial-in number is in the um, agenda. Um, I'm sorry your connection isn't working, um, but you might try just calling in and then you could be on audio at least. Um, I am conscious of the time. You know, we're uh, really like a half an hour of what we choose, but I, I I haven't wanted to curtail the discussion because I think we're getting so much good information and advice. Um, we haven't heard from Betsy Tyler, who does a lot of these surveys. Betsy, is there anything that you wanted to say just about the logistics or about anything? Um, I'm sorry, my video seems to have disappeared, but um, I hope you can hear me. Um, I have worked on, um, let me see if I can start the video. No. Um, I have worked on the historical narrative section of the Form Bs um, on many occasions, and I've, I've done research on more than dozens of houses on the island, probably hundreds at this point, um, extensive deed research, and with all the other resources that are available. And as Holly says, they are in many, many different places. Um, a lot of primary source material, a lot of you know, HABS reports, other reports that have been done over the years that are not entirely accurate. And for any history that I do of a house, I start at the very beginning and I revisit, you know, what has been said about a house. And then I do the, the documentary research, the maps, every, it's a very complicated and detailed process. Uh, I love doing it. Um, I'd love to be involved in all of this, but, um, you know, I do, like I said, just one part of the form B and you need an architect or an architectural historian to do the architectural analysis section. So sometimes I do it as teamwork, you know, I do with others. Um, and I think that's one way to look, you know, is you can't necessarily have a consultant who's able to do both, uh, both parts of that form. Brian might be an exception there, but, um, you know, I think you need a list of consultants who can perhaps work with each other to do these forms. Um, they take a lot of time if you want to do them accurately, comprehensively, but they need to be done. So um, that's, that's my comment. It's been a fascinating discussion and I, I this very thoughtful group of people and I'm happy to, to listen and contribute what I can. Thank you so much, Betsy. Um, Angus, did you dial in? I did. I was in there before. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah. 
Yes, we can hear you. Oh, good. Uh, yes, I appreciate everybody's comments. Uh, I, I think it's clear to everyone we need a comprehensive survey uh, and, and would benefit greatly by having all the resources uh, that everyone has mentioned in one place so that when you look up an address, all that information either pops up or a link pops up. And what it comes down to is, is, is devoting the resources necessary to make that happen. Um, it's, it's been a little bit disconcerting to um, have as much resistance as we've had uh, between the HDC and the select board and, um, and the, the planning director um, just in, in becoming a, a CLG so we can get some of the funding that um, we're not finding otherwise through the town. Um, and so I, I think we're, we're desperately trying to find or, or, or create another form of revenue whether it's uh, through grants or through the applicant or some other fee structure to uh, facilitate that funding. Um, so uh, I, I think we're all headed in the, in the right direction. It's like whatever, what, what can we do that will stick and, and move this forward? Madam Chair, if I just wanted to, to mention, um, for, for the record, uh, the planning director is actually very supportive of the CLG. There's just a few things we need to make sure from a, a, a town council perspective, as well as a town charter in the, the legislation. You know, again, we've had the legislation for the HDC since 55. We just wanna make sure that there's, there isn't anything that um, could be an issue, but he is supportive of the CLG. That's, that's great to hear, Holly. Um, and thank you for sharing that. Um, okay, so, where to go next? Um, I think we, uh, I don't think we need to take a vote, but um, I think we're going to take the advice that um, we've got the overall surveys that need to happen and that will happen through a survey plan that we should develop. And um, Angus and I will follow up with Holly and Andrew as we usually do after the meeting about that as a takeaway um and report back to you all but then we also have this evaluation process um, that happens day in day out in incredible large volumes with varying degrees of the necessary information and how do we um, get the resources to be able to get the information holly needs get the information the hdc needs and um how can we advocate that that happens? And I use the word advocate because when something needs to happen and it's important to your mission, you ask for it to happen. And I know that um, Chris has said it's certainly appropriate for us and consistent with other historical commissions that we would do that. Um, so uh, I think we have um, moved the ball forward a little bit uh, and um, we're over time. I just want to mention um, again that the last item on our agenda, preventative maintenance bylaw, is not going to be discussed today. Um, and I also wanted to say that there were some people who were um, upset that their buildings had been discussed in a packet. Um, and I wanted to apologize for um, any insensitivity. In hindsight, it certainly seems very rational that they should be upset by this, even though there was only public information shared. Um, so I wanted to apologize. I certainly don't want to be upsetting anybody or be irresponsible. Um, and with that being said, uh, I'll ask if there's any other business um, that any of the commissioners would like to bring up. No. Um, hearing none, uh, I'd like to ask for a motion to adjourn. Move. Um, Second. Thank you, Angus. Um, all in favor, uh, Georgia? Aye. Um, Clement? Aye. David? Aye. Uh, Angus? Aye. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so all much right. to our guests, uh, Chris and to Brian and Betsy and Mary who are here. My mother-in-law Shirley was here. <laughs> And uh, I'll talk to you all soon. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you, guys.